Our scripture for today is Amos chapter 7, verse 10 through 17. Then Amazi, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus saith, for thus hath, uh, for thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amazi said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amazi, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from, the fo from following the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Your wife shall be a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be divided up with a measuring line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away from this land. Good afternoon, family. Um, as always, it's a joy um, to gather with you to see your faces and to worship King Jesus together. I want to thank you guys for being here. Um, I did want to take a moment and just praise God for a few things that he's done for us recently, um, just for provision. I'm praying for a place to meet, and he provided this place, which has been great. Um, we have nice restrooms. We're gathering here, good acoustics, the kids space, the kids workers, you know, that's probably not the most ideal. Um, but it really was great to, to just see that. It kind of came out of nowhere, as so many things have. The other thing is God's just been faithful to provide in the area of finances. We're very transparent with that. And it's been really cool coming into September was when we, I kind of, my salary moved from our sending church to fully with New Eden Church. And though we do still have um, outside support coming in, like literally our budget went quite a bit up because of that. Um, at the point, we were pretty low budget uh, before me coming on full time. And our giving has just literally, like you can see the spreadsheet, it's just tracked exactly with that for the month of September and October. And I don't know if that'll maintain, that's fine. But I just want to say thank you to you guys for being faithful to give. And then also just praise God for his provision, because some of that was also outside gifts, just kind of out of nowhere. I um, mean, it's really cool to see God be faithful in that. Um, I did want to ask you guys to pray for me this this week. Um, I've got a trip coming up um, Tuesday through Thursday. I'll leave town uh, early Thursday morning and I'm going to Charlottesville, Virginia um, to hang out with some guys from a church planner cohort I was a part of. Um, the church planner cohort, our last few meetings got canceled because of COVID. And so we did them over Zoom. So we're kind of doing just this last hurrah to catch up, um, see how everybody's doing to learn and glean from each other. Um, so just pray for that. You guys met Jay Will. He's a part of that cohort. He preached for us a few weeks back. Um, also pray for my wife and kids while I'm away, because that's a difficult time on them. She's got to handle all the four kids and being the chauffeur by herself. And it's not as if I do a, a ton, you know, anyway, she does most of it. Um, no, I, I do more. I should give myself a little bit of credit, but um, yeah, so just pray for her while I'm gone. Um, that can be a difficult time. So um, yeah, we're getting near the end of Amos. We've got this week and then two more weeks. Um, so we'll finish, we'll do Amos chapter eight next week, and then we'll do Amos chapter nine the week after that. Um, the plans, just so you guys are informed, we'll probably have a standalone one week. And then our plan is to go through the book of Jude um, in about three weeks. We could probably spend more weeks there, but we'll do a flyover of Jude, and then we'll do a four-week Advent series uh, for the month, the last week of uh, November, and then the three weeks of December. Um, so yeah, you guys can be um, just praying for that. I look forward to that. 
And one of the things I do enjoy about pastoring is the freedom I get to just meet with people and hang out with people and talk to people, um, hear about their life. And a lot of times we do that over lunch or coffee. And this last week I was meeting with someone catching up and we were eating over Mexican food, just catching up. Um, it was amazing. It was in Athens. And as you do, when you get Mexican food, you always have to get some chips and queso, right? You, it's not, you have to do that, right? So we're sitting there and we're talking and he's in the middle of sharing something with me and he takes a bite of his chips and some cheese gets right there on his beard. And so he's in the middle of talking, you know, it's just sitting there bouncing up and down. I hope you can see this visual with me. And, and the cheese is just sitting there on his beard, bouncing up and down. And I'm waiting for this moment to kind of interject and let him know he's someone I know pretty well. So I wouldn't just, you know, let him walk around all day with dry queso there on his beard. Um, but yeah, so finally I just interrupt him. I'm like, hey man, like I'm trying to listen to what you're saying, but you've got some cheese right there and I'm really not hearing anything that you're saying. And so I just let him know, hey, you know, you've got cheese on your beard. I know we've all been on both sides of that scenario where either we've been the one that someone told us, hey, something's going on. And then if someone told you and you've been walking around all day like that, you're like, why didn't someone let me know, right? Like a true friend will speak the truth to me when they need, when I got something going on that I can't see when I have a blind spot, right? Now I found that we, we always like that when it's something like queso on our beard, but when it's something maybe a little more serious, um, sometimes we don't always respond as well when someone points out a blind spot that we have or some truth that we're missing, um, we don't always respond as well. Um, we're called to do that in the Christian community to speak the truth in love when we see something or someone has a blind spot. We're, tr we're called to speak the truth from the motivation of love for the person we're speaking to. Now that's not an excuse to just go around and be a jerk because I hear people do that like, you're just a jerk to everybody. And you're like, man, I'm just speaking the truth in love, bro. I don't know what you're upset about. Um, that's not, you know, what I'm advocating. Um, but we are called to speak the truth in love. And in the book of Amos so far, we've seen the prophet do that. He's willing to speak truth um, to people that he loves. And we kind of got to get to see a glimpse of that last week when we saw his heart pleading for Israel. It was different than maybe the prophet Jonah. If you remember him, he didn't even want the people that he was speaking to to repent. He was actually really angry at God when they finally did repent. So obviously like he's speaking truth, but it's not from the proper motivation of love. Now God still used that, but Amos, I believe his motivations are pure and proper. It seems as if we saw last week, he genuinely is calling Israel to repent because they're not being who God has called them to be. And he's calling them to see their blind spot. This week though, as we finish up chapter seven, we're going to see that as Amos does that, the response is not one of gratitude. You know, thank you for pointing out the case on my beard. That's not the response. The response is one of dismissing him. And we're going to kind of see how they reject him. Most of the book of Amos so far has been kind of these snapshots of Amos's prophecies and his sermons. So we're kind of getting a glimpse, a compiled list of his sermons, so to speak. But in our text this week, we really get the only narrative portion that we see. We actually see a conversation between Amos and Amaziah and between Amaziah and Jeroboam. And so we kind of get a break from these visions and this narrative. And we get to see, sorry, from the visions that we saw last week, and we'll see some more next week. And we get to see this narrative and it gives us insight into how people responded to his message. message. So let's look at verse 10, um, and we're going to read verse 10 through 11 quickly and see how this conversation starts. It says that Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And so we see this guy introduced as Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. Most likely with the influence he has, he's probably the high priest in the land. He probably holds a distinguished role. And so we're just introduced to this guy, Amaziah. Um, we hear that, you know, he's hearing about this prophet Amos, right? This guy prophesying in the land, prophesying against injustice. Um, most likely the leadership in this land is pretty uncomfortable with this guy, Amos, because we know that Amos has not held back when it comes to talking about the injustice in the land. And if anything, for those in positions of leadership, positions of power and privilege, he's actually held them more responsible than everyone else in the land. He's been very frank with this. And so we see um, the leadership here. They like their role, though. They're experiencing earthly security and wealth and comfort. And so they really don't want anybody rocking the boat. Um, they're being unfaithful to Yahweh. They're oppressing others. 
but their positions are secure. And so this guy, Amos, is challenging that. Again, Amos hasn't held back his critique of injustice. And so the hope would be, as Amos speaks, is that those in positions of power and leadership would repent and then lead the nation into repentance as well. That's, that would be the hope, but that's not what has happened. See, the people are in this sense of spiritual exile. Um, even though physically they're still dwelling the land that God gave them when they left Egypt, that he promised he was going to give them, they've already chosen, in a sense, spiritual exile away from God. They've rejected the covenant that Yahweh had made with them. God had called them to be a light to the nations, and instead they become like the other nations. And so Amos, on the authority of the word of God, and we see that Amaziah doesn't like this, he said that Israel is now going to go into physical exile. They're going to reap the fruit of the spiritual exile that they have chosen. They've said, we don't want God in our lives. We don't want to listen to him and his word. And so he says, eventually you're also going to end up in physical exile. As we disregard God and his covenant promises, as we wander off into exile spiritually, as we want to do our own thing and be alone, we want our own way. The fruit of that, as God warned Israel, is to eventually be in exile. Amaziah doesn't like that. And so we see this conversation that he has first with Jeroboam, who was the king. We saw him a little bit in week one as we were kind of introducing the book. We're told uh, in other passages that Jeroboam did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so Jeroboam is leading the way in this injustice, in this land of evil that has forsaken God. But Amaziah comes and he complains to Jeroboam about this guy, Amos. So he kind of appeals to a higher authority and says, hey, King Jeroboam, you got to do something about this guy, Amos. He said, you're going to die by the sword. He said, the land is going to go off into exile. And we don't see really any response from Jeroboam. Now, Jeroboam might have not wanted to disrupt the people. Um, maybe he didn't believe it. He looks around and he sees wealth. He sees military might. And he's like, who's this random, you know, crazy prophet that traveled up here from Judah to speak to us? Just leave him alone. I'm not really worried about it. I'm not bothered by him. So for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to work. Now, Amaziah does accuse Amos of committing treason. He says he's conspired against the land. Now we know that's not Amos's heart. We know that Amos is just trying to speak truth, but Amaziah tries to discredit Amos to King Jeroboam. He twists what Amos is saying, but again, it doesn't work. And so then what happens is Amos goes directly to Amaziah in verses 12 and 13. Look at that. Amos chapter seven, verse 12 and 13. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, Go, flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. So Amaziah tries to get appeal to King Jeroboam to force Amos to leave. That doesn't work. So he confronts him directly and he tells him, just, just leave. Like, hey, if you want to prophesy, cool. Like you can do that all day. You can speak your sermons. You can tell people about the injustice in the land. Just, just don't do it here. Like go down to Judah, go prophesy there. Um, you know, everything was fine before you showed up and started talking about all this injustice. And the injustice wasn't a problem till you brought it up. And honestly, I think the injustice would just go away if you'd quit talking about it. Like it was fine. I don't know what you're talking about. He also says one of the reasons he needs to stop is that this is an important person. He says, this is the king's sanctuary and it's a temple of the kingdom. I mean, this is a prominent person you're attacking. Like, let's not talk about injustice and abuse when it's somebody in a position of power. Just go somewhere else and deal with it elsewhere. As if Amos should be quiet just because the person perpetuating injustice is someone in power or someone who's prominent or has a lot of followers on Instagram, right? Whatever it is. And then he again attacks his character. He tells him, go eat bread in Judah. Now, culturally, this doesn't make sense to us, but what he's insinuating here is that Amos is only prophesying to be able to eat bread. He's only prophesying to make money. Now, there were false prophets that would go around and what the scriptures call tickle ears and just tell the people what they wanted to hear. And in return, the people would give them money and take care of their needs. But here, Amos, that's not what he's doing. And so he's implying that Amos is only in it for the money. So he's again attacking his character. Now that's not Amos. We'll see in a minute. He's just trying to stay faithful. But what I want you to see is that when truth is presented to Amaziah, who's supposed to be the one to affirm that truth, to lead the nation in this, we see kind of two main responses. First, to attack the character of Amos. So twist what's actually happening to attack his character. And the second thing is just to tell him to go away or be quiet, go do it elsewhere. 
And this is something that we have to guard against today in the church as well. I mean, I've seen this not not only in local churches, but in the broader church. When someone brings up or raises awareness about an issue in the church, we have to ask, are we more worried about what people will think or about the perception or about the fact that the injustice actually took place? And I've seen this, like just log on to Twitter and you'll see it, but people who expose injustice in the church are then called names, their character is attacked, They're told that, hey, if you don't keep quiet, then people aren't going to get saved or that they're not submitting to leadership properly. They're just angry, whatever it is. And that's absolutely the wrong response. People who point out injustice aren't the ones who need to be dealt with. The workers of injustice are, are the ones who need to be dealt with. I've probably seen this happen most recently in the church um, on a broad scale with sexual abuse. Um, where victims of sexual abuse who were manipulated uh, by position, those in positions of power, those victims are discredited and ignored because they speak out. And, and especially when it's someone who's prominent or they lead a prominent ministry that's had a lot of influence, supposedly. The tactic isn't new. We saw it with Amaziah and we see it in the church today. And I'm, I'm really grateful for voices like Rachel Den Hollander and Diane Langberg who speak out and elevate voices of victims and are doing work in the broader church to bring awareness to these issues. The reality is most victims of, of either spiritual abuse or sexual abuse don't actually want to speak out because they know that their life is going to be forever changed, that they're going to be attacked, that their character will be dragged through the mud, but they do it because they care about possible and potential future victims. When it comes to sexual abuse or abuse of power in the church, it's extremely rare for there to only be one victim. And that's just one example in the church. I've seen it in the way, um, especially historically, uh, the way women are treated in the church. And and sometimes women speak out about the dangers and and the way women can be treated in the church. And and here at New Eden Church, like we believe in biblical God-honoring gender roles, but we also believe that women should never, ever be treated as less than. And we shouldn't have to say that, but we do because it's important to say And unfortunately, I've seen this sometimes where prominent men um, will say things towards women who are strong voices in the universal church. They told them to go home instead of inviting them to a table, just go do that elsewhere instead of inviting them to a table and giving them a voice. And like, we have to understand if, if women are ignored in the church, then literally we can't fulfill the great commission we've been called to do. Like it's, it's a mandate starting back actually in Genesis in the garden and then moving forward to the great commission where we see the fulfillment of that to make disciples. We have to all be involved and united in that. I've also seen it happen where anyone who talks about issues of injustice, especially things like racism. We'll see this in the church. And I don't know if you guys see any of this, hopefully not, because there's some infighting, but you'll, they'll either call them Marxist or social justice warriors when most of the time, and, and I'm not saying we don't have to guard against ideologies of this age creeping into the church, but most of the time, these are godly men just trying to raise awareness, awareness about issues. And they're the furthest thing from a Marxist. They're trying to say, hey, let's be biblically faithful to the text and what the scriptures call us to. But again, it's a way to simply kind of discredit the message and shut it down. If I can just attack you and name call, now we're not even talking about the issue. We're just name calling brothers in Christ. I've seen it the other way, um, where people who are trying to hold to faithful biblical interpretation regarding gender roles or God's plan for sexuality, maybe they can be labeled legalist or bigots or old fashioned or whatever. And, And these are just ways that just kind of shut the conversation down. And now we're not even actually saying, what does the text say? What does God call us to? Instead, we're just name calling and we're just discrediting each other. So we've seen that in the church. And then culturally on a broader level, Um, I've seen this play out, even just in our nation or in our city. Um, We have to understand that critiquing injustice or calling out injustice is not unpatriotic. It's actually the most patriotic thing you can do. Um, And so to just say, hey, if you don't like it, you can go elsewhere. Like, that's not the right response. Like, if you don't like our country, go elsewhere right? Like to critique our country is, is okay. And I don't think like anyone, if we were as a church, anytime a member came to elders and said, Hey, here's just something I've been thinking of and something I've, I've thought of, maybe we could grow in. And we said, well, if you don't like it, there's many churches down the street, go elsewhere. Like that's, that's not the, the proper response, right? That again, just shuts the conversation down. 
Um, here in our city, recently, there were some situations that happened where there were some possible abuses of power. And so um, the, it, it got out public and some videos got out, and I'm not even going get, to get into the exact situation. I don't even know all the details. I was in different meetings with city leaders um, and just different pastors in the city afterwards, just kind of processing what had happened. And, and I'm, again, I'm not going to go into all the details, but the one thing that I think was the saddest to me was I heard from a few leaders that they were more sad that the public knew about the possible injustice than the fact that the injustice happened. And we have to guard against that. Like when, when something is made public, again, we just walk in humility and repentance where we need to. We walk in truth, as we're going to see in a minute, we stand on truth, um, but we, we can grieve over injustice taking place. Um, I've seen it happen on both sides of the political aisle. I mean, were we just throwing darts at each other and we're name calling, whether one side is calling the others Marxist or traitors and the other side is calling them bigots and backwards and, and we could just go down the list. I actually had more I was going to say, but I'm going to just let that go, right? We have to be careful with that because here's the thing that I want to challenge us as the church. When the world does it, like I expect that. When the world name calls and discredit and just tries to silence people who are raising awareness about issues, I expect that. But here in the church and as Christians, we are called to engage with truth while protecting, protecting the dignity of those that we are conversing with at all times. Because as we do that, my guess is that we'll find that all of us on one level or another have blind spots. And we all have a lot to learn when it comes to injustice. And so we can be grateful when that's exposed, not upset or angry. So when injustice or sin is exposed, whether systemically or in our own hearts, may we guard against the response of arrogance that just shuts down conversation and attacks the character of the person speaking. May our response be one of humble introspection and the honest seeking of truth. And, and as you do that, maybe you'll find that that's a false prophet who's just in it for the money. Like that might actually be the case because they are out there. But maybe we'll find that we or others around us need to repent and that there was truth spoken. So let's see. So we saw kind of Amaziah try to discredit Amos and tell him to go away. So we see how he responds. But now let's see how Amos responds to Amaziah's response. Look at verses 14 and 15. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people, Israel. Now we looked at this a little bit in the first week when we saw some background on Amos, this shepherd turned prophet, but I love his response here. He's like, I'm not some professional prophet who's peddling for money. I'm not like just trying to get whatever I can out of this. Like I was doing fine. I was a, you know, lowly herdsman, just kind of doing my job, trimming some figs, doing my thing out in the field, making some money. And then God called me to do this. And I was like, all right, here we go. Like, do you think I wanted to like be put in the spotlight and be attacked and have my character attacked? He's like, I just, God called me and I had to obey. God called this nobody to speak truth to the people of Israel. And Amos shares that this is a word from the Lord. Ultimately, it's not just his opinion. It's not him just trying to pick a fight. It's not him just trying to make money. God called him to do this, so he had to obey. And I love this little narrative because we get a glimpse into Amos' heart and where his conviction comes from. This is something he's doing no matter the response of the people around him because he feels like God has called him to do this. And I, and I do believe that, that that would be the heart of most pastors. Now, again, we've, we've talked about this. There is abuse of power, and that needs to be called out when it's there. But I believe most pastors speak not, not to make money, not to gain popularity, but honestly from a, a place of conviction that God has called them to take the good news of the gospel, something that has changed their life, to then change a hurting world around them. And not just pastors, but for all of us as God's people. See, that's the thing about truth. When God calls us to speak it, we can't do anything but obey and then just leave the results up to God. Amos stands in a long line of imperfect nobodies who simply chose to say, God, I trust you and the message you've given me, I can't help but speak it. As I was reading this, it reminded me of Peter and John shortly after the resurrection and after the spirit was breathed on them and they're preaching the gospel 
And there was a place where they were preaching the gospel and the religious leaders, just like in our text today, they didn't like it because it was challenging their own um, religion. It was challenging their own traditions and their own power. And so they told Peter and John, hey, like you guys can, can speak and you can have these meetings. Just don't speak in the name of Jesus. Like don't talk about this guy, Jesus. Hey, everything else is cool. Like you guys want to gather, you want to have a little community, fine, but don't talk about Jesus. And I want you to notice in Acts chapter four, how Peter and John responded. It says, Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. They say in Acts 4.20, we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. So just like Peter and John, and just like Amos, when anyone comes face to face with the life transforming person of Jesus and his work, there's no way to stay silent about what he's done. The world may call us foolish and other people may try to silence us or discredit us. But when our conviction on speaking truth about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and when that conviction comes from God himself, God himself, and when the truth we speak is God's, not ours, we're able to just speak and stand with Peter and John and Amos and say, we're unable to stop speaking about the things we've heard. When we've really seen Jesus, it changes us. And our, my hope for us is as we read this, that we would be encouraged that in a world full of falsehoods and political ideologies and where we don't even know what the truth is so many times that's being proclaimed out in the world, that we can simply proclaim the truth of God's work in the person of Jesus and just let it do its work. That it's not up to us to try to convince people or manipulate people, but rather we can just proclaim the truth and let it do its work. We're called to be faithful, even when it's unpopular or it costs us. We see that continue down through history as people are willing to even lose their lives for the sake of gospel advancement. We see that in the persecuted church, when those that are persecuted for their faith, they ask those of us who are in places of comfort where we can experience freedom to gather like we are tonight, they ask us to pray for them and their prayers are not for freedom like we have, but rather for boldness and conviction to keep proclaiming the truth because they know that no matter whether people are persecuting them or not, no matter whether they're making martyrs out of them, that the gospel will still go forth and do its work. That's what Amos is doing here. So he tells where his conviction comes from. And then in verses 16 and 17, as we heard read, he reiterates what he's already prophesied. So we already heard it read, but he says again, hey, you're right. I did say Israel was going to go into exile. And then not only that, he gets kind of personal. This is the only really personal prophecy we see other than towards Jeroboam. But he says that Amaziah is going to lead the way in being stripped from his comfort and security. Just as he's led the way in injustice, he's now going to lead the way in going off into exile. We won't look at all these things promised. They seem kind of harsh about his wife becoming a prostitute, which just was a way to say that she was going to be in so much poverty that she would have to turn to prostitution to try to just survive and his kids would be destroyed. See, what's going on here and all these things, we're not going to go into all of them, but everything that Amos prophesies, if we go back to the law, it's what God prophesied would happen to those who forsook his covenant. It's the end result of trying to live out your own way and do your own thing. It's the end result of spiritual exile that we choose is also physical exile. Now, the irony of this would not be lost on the readers. So Amaziah here is kind of representative of the entire nation of Israel. And what he tries to do is essentially force Amos into exile. He says, you go away, but ultimately they would be the ones to reap the fruit of what they've chosen, the spiritual exile, and they would be exiled away from the presence of God into utter destruction. Early in our text, I don't know if you remember, but Amaziah said that the land could not bear all the words of Amos. But in reality, these were not Amos's words, they were God's words. And the people should have heeded these words because even though sometimes the words of God can be painful and it can seem like we're not able to bear them and they can be hard to hear, ultimately, it is the words of God that bring life to us. 
It's what God said when he originally entered into covenant union with his people. He said, today I set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life so you can live. Choose union with me. In Amos 5, that's what Amos reiterated. He said, choose life, do good, seek good, seek God so that you can live. This is not God just angry. He's saying, hey, I want you to experience life. Choose me because his words are what ultimately brings life. And when we ignore God's truth or we dismiss it, or maybe we um, dismiss its messengers and its proclaimers of truth, we're in danger of missing out on what God has for us, which ultimately we need to see this is life and union with him. The opposite of spiritual exile, which is union with the father. The scariest thing we can do is to choose spiritual exile to reject God and say, hey, we want to be our own God. Whether that be forsaking him by worshiping the false idols that we create in our culture that we fashion or by forsaking him in the way that we treat others. Because choosing to reject God will always lead to eternal exile. The fruit of choosing our own way will always lead to exile and destruction and it's not pleasant. And we don't like to talk about it, but it's a reality. And it's something we need to hear and we can't ignore the truth just because we don't like it, myself included. Now, we know that for Amaziah and the people of Israel, that they chose spiritual exile, that they ultimately rejected the words of God that were given to them by this faithful prophet, Amos. We know they eventually were into exile and ultimately they got what they wanted as they tried to silence Amos. Ultimately, that's what God gave them gave them over to the fruit of their own desires when there was silence for 400 years, no voice of God in the land, no prophet spoke. And ultimately, all of us, all of humanity, we try our own way. And and ultimately, we try to silence God and send him away. And eventually, as we do that, and we turn to these false gods that can't hear, can't see, can't speak, can't ultimately fulfill us, ultimately, we find ourselves alone and in exile. When everything lets us down, we find ourselves in the mess of either injustice around us or in the depths of the brokenness in our own hearts, and we have nowhere to turn. We're left alone and broken and in exile. But God in his grace will never leave us alone. He will kick down any wall. He will fight any enemy. He'll tear down any lie. He'll enter into any mess to reveal to us his glory and his beauty, to show us where true life is, to take our eyes off of worthless things of this age and fix them on himself, to bring us back from exile into union with the Father. And that's what happens in the person and work of Jesus. Though we all deserved to be left alone, Though we all deserve to be given over to the fruit of our own desires and left in spiritual exile and being alone, Jesus takes on human flesh and he enters into human history to redeem an exiled humanity. And if you remember the story of Jesus, just like Amos, he's rejected by the religious leaders of the day. They don't like his message because it challenges their power and their traditions as he calls in with his life and his message He challenges injustice. He calls in the outcast, the oppressed, the poor, and the broken, and the sinners. And his message to them isn't clean up your act and get it right. And his message to them also isn't, hey, let's lead a physical insurrection and overthrow your oppressors. No, the message was, I am king and I am the savior and trust me and believe in the good news of my kingdom. Trust that I am king and listen to the words of life that I bring. And this message was so scandalous that ultimately it got him killed. Eventually this message led him to be crucified on a Roman cross all alone outside the city, numbered with thieves. And as this happens, he enters into the exile, the loneliness that should have been ours alone. He was forsaken by his friends and his family. And he was left all alone to die. Even his closest disciples betrayed him and forsook him. And as bad as all that was, like, I don't know if you've ever been hurt by someone that you thought was your friend and then they betrayed you and it hurts and you feel alone and you feel just left and empty. And as bad as all that was, that was nothing in comparison to the spiritual cosmic exile that he experienced as the father turned his face away. 
as Jesus became sin for us. And so the Father couldn't look on that sin. He becomes sin for us so that we might become his righteousness. Jesus willingly entered into that to redeem wicked sinners, to beat death and hell and to put the world to right. And as he entered into exile, he went to bring the captives home. This time to become captive, not to sin and injustice, but instead captive to the father for good, never more to forsake him. And in the resurrection, when Jesus get back, gets back up, he proves his authority and his victory. He gets back up from the clutches of death, reunited with the father, sitting at his right hand. And here's the thing, when he does this, he doesn't come back alone. He brings all to be united to the father who would trust in him as savior and king. And he doesn't leave us alone to the fruit of our own devices. He doesn't leave us in exile. He comes there to get us and bring us back to covenant union with the father. And this time, because this work is based on the work of the true high priest, there's no more return to exile because it's based on his work, not ours. It's based on his faithfulness to the covenant, not ours. It's sure and done because the work was finished on the cross. And eventually in the eternal kingdom, what we see thrown out into exile is all injustice. All evil is gotten rid of in the new and final creation. Both the evil all around us that we don't know how to deal with and we try to fight, but we don't really know what to do. Like it's gonna be dealt with once and for all. And also the injustice and evil and wickedness and unrighteousness that we find in our own hearts. And we, if we're followers of Jesus, like we hate it. We stand with Paul and we say, we don't wanna do this. We hate it. Like Jesus is gonna take that and rip it out and cast it into exile, never more to return. And we'll be presented pure and white to Jesus, our groom. And we're going to live with him forever and ever. And this time there's no threat of exile ever again. And the whole land, as the land in Amaziah's day could not bear the word of the Lord, this time the land will be filled with the word of the Lord, which represents his rule, his good rule and reign. And we'll submit to that because we'll love it, because our hearts will be finally and forever sanctified. And so we won't be bucking up against what God has for us. We'll see his word as what it is, which is life. This is the hope of Amos. This is the hope that it's driving us to and calling us to look for. And this is the only lasting message for a hurting world. To those who haven't trusted Jesus, who, who can't stand with Peter and John and say, man, like we can't help but speak and see what we've heard of. Maybe we've heard about Jesus, but we've not really seen his beauty and his majesty and experienced him. For those of us that find ourselves there, we say, turn from trusting in worthless things to trust in the living God. Repent of sin. Quit looking for answers in the world. They're never going to be enough. They might be temporary band-aids, but they're not going to take a dead heart and make it live and beat. But when you trust Jesus, he'll do that work for you. Trust in his good work. And for those of us who have this message, may this be our primary voice. As we engage, you guys know I care about, like, let's speak out against injustice, but we have to make sure that we begin and end with Jesus. Like, he, he's the only thing that can ultimately cure injustice. Like, we've got to stand on that, right? And we can, like, all truth is God's truth. So as the worlds and philosophies of this age overlap with biblical truth, praise God for that. But that's ultimately not where we stand. We stand on Jesus and his good news. And so in a world full of philosophies and theories and ideas about how to bring about true justice, may we always begin and end with Jesus. He's the king, he's the savior, and may we trust that he, he is enough.